Hi, I'm Keith Simonton, and welcome to this edition of What to Watch, devoted to our special guest, three-time Academy Award nominee, actor, writer, and director, Ethan Hawke. I had a chance to sit down with him during the Adweek conference in New York City to discuss his long and successful career. And we started our discussion with how Hawk landed his first film role in director Joe Dante's Explorers. It's a little mysterious to me now when I think back on it, about how, how all that could happen. I was living in New Jersey. Um, I was interested in acting, and I had a friend of mine who uh, today is a very good, accomplished, uh, his name is Brandon Boyce, and he's an accomplished screenwriter. He lived down the street, and he was interested in acting. And I'd had this experience on St. Joan that was really powerful. The performing of it was fine, you know, I had a couple lines and that was neat. But being around the adult actors and listening to them in the rehearsal room talk about Joan of Arc and break down George Bernard Shaw and really study that play, I became a, it didn't seem like a job. It was so much fun. And you know, I've been watching my parents, they worked really hard and their life seemed to be happening on the periphery. You know, most of their day was spent at work, and then they would try to live a little bit a couple hours a day. And um, these people got to do like the best part of life all the time. And it was really interesting to me watching them rehearse. So this kid lived down the street, and he was cool, and, and, and he, would, he used to go into New York on auditions. And so I asked my mom if I could go on some auditions, and, as long as it didn't cost any money, it was fine. <laughs> and um, so I didn't have any headshots or anything, so I just tagged along with Brandon. And um, one of them ended up being for Joe Dante's Explorers, and at the time, that was a really big deal. They were doing this nationwide search. He had just done Gremlins. Gremlins, which is huge. You know, so Explorers, you know, I, it was supposed to be this giant movie, you know, I was, and I was, you know, the the needle they found in the haystack. I was supposed to be this, <laughs> supposed to be this huge coming out party and I was gonna be, you know, the whatever, the little, you know, the Justin Bieber of my, the moment. <laughs> but I, I, I failed miserably and, uh, and I went from being the coolest kid in school, like, I was like, oh, he's got a part in a movie, to like, you're a loser, dude. That movie was terrible. <laughs> um, and it was, Really, I like to say it was the greatest lesson in the arts I could have possibly had at the age of, you know, I got the part when I was 13, and I did it when I was 14. Jeez. And, um, but I had the real experience of unbelievable hype. Right. And then, you know, for years afterwards, I would have these re this reoccurring nightmare that they were remaking Explorers without me. You know, that it was like, basically, they just decided the fundamental problem was me. And... <laughs> And so River, River Phoenix is in the movie, and Joe Dante was a brilliant director, and they were all just doing it without me, and I went to the premiere and met the new kid. This was in my dream. And um, so I kind of had enough of acting for a little while. Yeah. You, uh, you broke your foot, if I'm not incorrect. Well, River broke my foot. Yeah, yeah no, I did. I broke my foot on the production. We, um, we stole River's dad's motorcycle, and I crashed it. And... Um, <laughs> And, uh, but it was really important to River that nobody find out that we were riding the motorcycle, which was really hard to do because my foot hurt a lot. <laughs> so uh, he kind of put me in the garage. I was supposed to have a sleepover at his house, you know, and he had made me stay in the garage. And then finally I was like, man, I think my foot really hurts. Like, I think I need to see a doctor or something. And then we got in so much trouble and they had to stop shooting. It was, it was a le learning lesson. It was a learning experience. Yeah. So you go to college, uh, and then you hear about this part. Uh, Dead Poets Society? For Dead Poets Society. And your parents weren't too thrilled. They were doing big casting calls for Dead Poets Society. And my name, you know, there's this kid. He did the little thing, and, you know, you might want to meet him. And so I came in to audition. I left. I was at school at Pittsburgh, and I left to come in and, and audition for it. And you get the part in Peter Weir's Dead Poets uh -huh. Society. Which was an amazing experience. Um, can you talk about the shoot and, uh, and, and how all that unfolded for you? Which, which, what do you remember about that the most? Well, if you'd asked me that question a year ago, I would have probably said one thing. But now, in, you know, whatever it is, late September of 2014, it's hard not to think about it all in the context of Robin mm -hmm. and his passing. 
Um, but Robin Williams went up on stage, or he was in the classroom, and he wrote on the chalkboard, I sound my barbaric yawp over the rooftops of the world, which is from a Walt Whitman poem, of course. And, and I proceeded to have my first real experience acting with him, who was an incredibly interesting person. I mean, well, everybody knows that he's a comic genius and everything like that, but he was also a Juilliard-trained actor mm -hmm. and had a tremendous love and respect for the whole profession. And he was not the heavyweight in the room. You know, the heavyweight in the room was Peter Weir, this Australian director uh, who I admired wildly. And so there's these two men who were much older than me and were in the height of their powers. They were fully mature artists giving me this experience. But he also had a very humorous side. I've, I've heard you make an analogy, or uh, one of the things that he would say when you guys would get your checks. Oh, carpe per diem, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's certainly funny, there's no doubt about that. No doubt about that. Um, let's move up to uh, Before Sunrise. Mm -hmm. um, 1995, mm -hmm. shoot it in 94, something like that. Something um, before, yeah. How do you meet Richard Linklater? Well, um, Slacker had just come out, Reality Bites hadn't come out yet, and he worked with uh, a young actor named Anthony Rapp, who was in Dazed and Confused. And um, I had started, after Dead Poets Society, some friends of mine and I had started a theater company. And I kind of took all my Dead Poets money and invested it in this little with, theater company. Uh, Robert Sean Leonard, right? With Robert Sean Leonard, yeah. Frank Whaley, um, from A Midnight Clear, Josh Hamilton, um, a bunch of great people. Uh, Steve Zahn was a part of it. and. Um, we were really interested in, in performing young pl new plays by young playwrights by our generation. You know, that was our thing. And, and one of the plays was called Sophistry, and Anthony Rapp was in it, and Richard Linklater had finished shooting Days of Confused, and he came to see it. And um, we, uh, we went out afterwards, and we ended up talking all night. And he told me about Before Sunrise at that point, and I kind of thought that he must be offering me the movie or something. But a little while later, this is back before you could email anything, a script showed up at my door. Um, a script of Before Sunrise. And so I was really excited. And then I found out from my agent that he wanted me to audition. I thought, well, we got along great. We had like four beers together. He loves me. <laughs> um, and, uh, but Rick's a serious person, you know? And, um, and uh, so, so we'd hung out that night, but then we really got to know each other through the audition process of Before Sunrise. And you audition, and uh, you audition um, with uh, different actresses. Uh -huh. um, can you talk about the pairing, the ultimate pairing? Well, uh, Julie Delpy is, um, you know what, it, you know some young women get called meek, you know? Julie Delpy's never been called meek in her life, <laughs> right? You know, so, she was ferocious in intellect. And she'd worked with? She'd already worked with Godard, she'd already worked with Kozlowski, yeah. she'd already worked with Volker Schlondorf. Yeah. This is a woman who was no demure young thing. I mean, she did look like a Botticelli angel. I mean, she was absolutely ravishing. At the time, I don't know if you remember, they, this is so out of fashion, it shows you how old I am, is, but they were doing these Gap ads, you know, where you know, people were like, look cool, and it's like, Gap, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and, it's actually kind of a funny story, which is that they'd ask Robert Sean Leonard to do one, and he called me up, should I do a Gap ad? And I was like, no way, no way. We didn't work this hard to sell jeans, Bob. We're artists, all right? And if you, you know, take this and, and you sell out just like this, you know, and truthfully, I was just jealous. You know, why did they, why did they ask him and not me? You know, and, and, and so he's like, you're right, you're so right, you're so right. Thank you, Ethan, and he hangs up the phone. Two hours later, they call me up and say, do you want to do it? <laughs> yes, I want to do it. But I couldn't do it because I told him. And so I'm, truthfully, I'm kind of, I'm kind of flirting with Julie, um, trying to tell her this story because I think it's kind of self-deprecating and funny or whatever. And I think, you know, I'm going to come off like a stud and she's going to like me. And she's like, I just did the gap ad. <laughs> and, and, uh, <laughs> and I was like, oh, yeah, well, that's cool. And... Um, uh, and then she just laid into me about how little I understood about art and how I, if you think denying a gap ad is going to make you an artist, then, but, you know, I've worked with guitar and, you know, 
So anyway, and then I had to go in and, you know, improv with her. And of course to her, I, I mean, look, I played football. I, I was about as a dopey American, you know. You know um, <laughs> this is the first time in my life, like she says, oh, did you like Raiders of the Lost Ark? And I'm like, oh yeah, totally. Yeah. She's like, mm-hmm. <laughs> American populist. <laughs> like, Wait, what? I didn't know anyone in the world didn't did think like, it was yeah, the best yeah. thing ever. Um, so, can you talk a little bit about, about Gattaca, um, since there is such this uh, fervent thing? Well, you know, explorers prepped me for the Gattaca experience. <laughs> I mean, Gattaca, there's just no doubt in my mind that this is one of the great writers working in movies today, you know? And this is a, Andrew Nichol wrote Truman Show. Uh, he, uh, he, the list is, is getting longer and longer, but he's a great, great screenwriter um, and a real original voice as a filmmaker and I just knew it. The second I read that script and the second I met him, I wanted to be in that movie and you know, I'm also a sci-fi fan. I love science fiction, science fiction at its best, Kurt Vonnegut, Philip K. Dick. All that stuff is some of my favorite writing in the world and you know, if it were up to me, the Nash, there'd be, Andrew would be in, given $30 million a year to make a movie. Yeah, just go. He, he just, just go. He's, um, he's a brilliant guy. Um, and it was hard when that movie first came out because I believed in it so much, but people wanted it to be an action movie. They were so disappointed in it, I don't know why. We couldn't actually even find a review to come out to put above the poster. You know, I mean, they always, every movie's got unbelievable or <laughs> astonishing or whatever it says, you know. Um, but we couldn't find anything but like, uh, Quietly, moderately entertaining, perhaps, or something. Cerebral is you know? not something you want to put. Yeah. yeah, super cerebral. But over time, that movie has found its audience, and I think people have understood what Andrew is really writing about and how relevant it is. He, he is as a sociopolitical thinker, and uh, I'm really proud of it. It makes me. I was standing in line at a bathroom at some big giant event, and I realized I was standing in line next to Bill Clinton. Yeah. It's me. I like that Gattaca. <laughs> we made it, baby. Check. Yeah. Um, let's talk about, a, I, I want to make sure that we definitely talk about um, what for me is one of uh, the best films of the year, uh, which premiered at the beginning of the year, mm -hmm. which is Richard, Richard Linklater's Boyhood. Um, yeah. Thank you. Do it. It's all right. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, for those who may not know yet um, about its unique creation, could you talk about, um, you know, it's, it's 2001, you meet with Richard Linkletter for coffee, and how's he describe what's his idea? Well, training days in the theaters, you know, we, um, I've made a couple movies with Rick, and, um, he basically tells me this idea that he's, what if you took a young person, a young actor, a six-year-old actor or something, and kind of a la Tolstoy's uh, book, it's called Boyhood Something in Youth, uh, Childhood, Boyhood, and Youth, uh, different translations, but the, it's like, what if we really mapped out that every time you see a movie about childhood, they always have to try to pinpoint it to one moment. You know, even the great ones, yeah. 400 Blows or something, because yeah, yeah. kids grow up. And you, but yet, childhood, he was saying, to me, wasn't one moment. You know, my childhood was like this, this, little, this river of a, a moment. And they, they, they all came to feel like one, you know, growing up. But that, what if we made a movie over 12 years? And we shot a couple scenes a year, and we just kind of created it. And... We, we, there's a natural infrastructure for an outline, which is first grade through 12th grade. Yeah. We're all... Public school every, system. Every American public school system, there's this 12-year grid which you're kind of imprisoned, you know, <laughs> and, and <laughs> incarcerated, you know. And, and so basically what we did was map out the parents. The kids don't have a lot of agency in whether they move or what they do, and they're just kind of responding to life, and they're growing. But the parents' infrastructure we need to work out. And, that, and the parents' architecture would be the architecture of the film. And, you know, Rick and I very quickly rose this would be an unbelievable opportunity to do a portrait of fatherhood, you, you know? And that, 
And I realized that I was being offered something that, to my mind, no actor had ever been offered before, which was to create a character using time as your clay, that I could map out a character's growth and, and let time be my ally. Meaning, like, you know, normally, like, what if I had played the last scene of Boyhood when I was 32? You know, I would have, like, grayed my hair, and I probably would have put on a giant fat suit and walked out with a cane. <laughs> I don't know what I would have thought being 44 was like, but, uh, you, you know, I, I, I certainly, I certainly wouldn't have played it the way I did. You know, one of the greatest accomplishments, I think, of Boyhood is Patricia Arquette's performance. No it's question. just because yeah. I really... Uh, I agree. It, and and I, I mention it only because men often get a chance to play complicated characters or people that are more than one thing. But women are so often asked to be one thing. I see it all the time in my co-stars, you know, where Patricia gets to be a mother, she gets to be a lover, she gets to be a student, she gets to be a teacher, she gets to be a great mom, she gets to be a bad mom, she gets to be a human being, you know, and, and Rick and, 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 and she created this, this opportunity. And I, I remember when I was finishing watching the movie, I was like, what's so unique about this? I'm like, oh, it's a, it's a woman I recognize from my life, right. not a woman I recognize as this, Archetype. from movies, yeah. you know, where like, I mean, I think it's so confusing. I even heard people at the first Q&As were being so confused. She was a good mom then, but then she did such a bad job with that moment. How could she do that? I'm like, well, yeah. Look at yourself, Mama. You know what I mean. You know, you do everything perfect. You know. But, yeah. at, and again, the con the conceit is that it was shot. Oh, right. Once a year, every year, three to five days, every year for twelve years. So you watch as this six year old turns into an eighteen year old, and it is very much about the the river of time, as as, yeah. as you were saying. And yeah. um, that the kids grow up and we age. I would also want to talk about a um, movie just premiered at Toronto and at the New York Fest Film Festival to great acclaim, um, which I've seen called Seymour and Introduction, mm. which is uh, a really lovely documentary. Um, do you want to talk about what, how this thing yeah. yeah, well, for those of you who don't know, it's, it's a, a documentary about a piano maestro who's 87 years old. Um, he keeps getting mad at me because I say he's 85. He's like, I'm trying to pawn him off as this youngster. Um, but he, he's 87, and he had a kind of profound effect on me, and I learned a lot from him. And so I just started interviewing him and filming these things, mostly because he realized that the kind of blind pursuit of being a success in the arts was proving detrimental to his development as a person, you know? And so at the age of 50, he quit performing, you know? This is a guy who opened Alice Tully Hall. He performed all over the world in Paris. Claimed pianist. Yeah, yeah, New York yeah. Times. Everything. Lauded. Yeah. And he just, he decided to dedicate the rest of his life to teaching and writing and to stop, to take out the competitive element of his life. And, uh, I was really kind of moved by him, and you know, obviously, I was looking in the mirror a little bit about myself entering the second half of, of my life, and what did I want it to look like, and what was I living it for, and it seemed like a kind of wonderful way to meditate on that was to study his decisions and how he felt about them, and my hope is that. You know, basically, like, I, I don't know, we were just talking, I just, the movie Whiplash just came out too, yeah. at the New York Film Festival, it's an amazing movie. And it, it proves this point, the Whiplash is about drums, my doc is about the piano, but sometimes Richard Linklater made a doc, uh, uh, Inning by Inning, uh, about a baseball coach named Augie, and, 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 like, baseball, music, a combustion engine, if you do anything really well, it's kind of the same as doing anything else really well. The same rules and principles apply of dedication, care, love, mm. respect, humility. You kind of keep stumbling back to these same building blocks you got taught when you were a kid about being a good sibling or something. Uh, and I, I find it really interesting. And so it began a process that turned into this documentary. I never wanted to make a doc. I still, as I talk about it, I can't believe I did it. I, didn't mean to do it. 
It's excellent, by the way. And it comes out and it'll come out next year, mm -hmm. I believe. Yeah. Um, and if the first, second half is anything like the first half, uh, Ethan, then you, it's, we just welcome the next set of uh, art. from. Well, you. thanks. It's a pleasure Good to be drawing. here. And thanks it's for your interest. pleasure to talk to yeah. you. Yeah. 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 To explore more of this amazing actor's body of work, visit his IMDb page, as well as those for his in-theater and upcoming movies like Boyhood. There you can find local movie showtimes and purchase movie tickets on imdb.com and our mobile apps.